I've been very fortunate to see Depeche Mode many times. In the late 80s, I saw them as a teenager. And like many people, I have great memories associated with them. I saw them in 2006 at Coachella with one of the first dates that I had with my now wife. I think that Depeche Mode are one of those bands that connect so many different people in different ways. There's people that like hardcore industrial stuff that love Depeche Mode. There's people that love pop music of any genre that love Depeche Mode. There are heavy rock guys that love Depeche Mode and there is everything in between. They have the art and they have the pop mixed together. And that is one of the things that I think is truly defining of an amazing band. When you can blend those two extremes. I talk about it a lot in different videos, but I just want to reiterate, Depeche Mode are a pop band and they're also pure art. And you get those two things intersecting when you can have art and creativity and you can write a song that millions of people can sing along. That is true brilliance. And that is Depeche Mode. Over the course of the 80s, British electronic music pioneers Depeche Mode were at the forefront of the synth pop and industrial pop music scenes, catapulting the alternative sounds of these worlds into mainstream attention. At the decade's end, and seemingly at the top of their potential, the band returned to the studio to record their seventh studio album, Violator. This landmark album includes several iconic singles, including Personal Jesus and Enjoy the Silence. With Enjoy the Silence, Depeche Mode took a serene ballad of satisfaction and wrapped it up in a disco dance ability, kicking off the 90s with a new wave of poignant, self-reflective songwriting which embraced the infectious sounds of pop. Hello there, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvelously well. Welcome back to another episode in the series. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you hit the notification bell, you'll be notified when we have a new video. And of course, if you're into production, you can go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. Depeche Mode developed out of a working class, religiously centered community in Basildon, Essex in the UK. And the intersecting youths of Andy Fletcher, Vince Clark, Dave Gahan, and Martin Gore. Fletcher and Clark, who was born Vince Martin, were both involved in their local Methodist church, St. Paul's, which had an active youth group for boys their age. Fletcher credits that community for the space where they began to learn how to play instruments and sing. Clark began writing simple songs, and their fellowship bands would often play covers of popular songs, like The Who's Can't Explain alongside contemporary religious songs. It wasn't long before Fletcher and Vince created their own band. And as Fletcher recalls, Vince and I had a group when we were 16 called No Romance in China, which tried to be like The Cure. We were into their Three Imaginary Boys LP. Vince used to attempt to sing like Robert Smith. Clark credits No Romance in China as the origins of Depeche Mode particularly noting that Fletcher began to grow musically once he picked up a bass. Fletcher was really quite good. He bought himself a bass guitar and I kind of showed him how to play it. He was very keen and enthusiastic, very eager to listen and learn. And that's really how Depeche Mode started. It was just me and Fletch. With a revolving community of musicians around them, the next big step in Fletcher and Clark's musical partnership was their group composition of sound which they formed in 1980, bringing in Martin Gore on keyboard. Gore told Number One magazine in 2007, me, Andy Fletcher, and Vince Clark started mucking about together. Vince was a local kid who lived minutes away. Andy I knew from going along to Boys Brigade and church. Composition of sound were inspired by the music of an English electronic band from Wirral Merseyside, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, or OMD. Clark told Pop Matters in 2020, Orchestral Maneuvers was such a huge influence on me, the reason I got into electronic music was because I heard the track almost. That's when I thought to myself, oh my god, electronic music actually has some emotion. And I wanted to do that, be a part of that.
1980, Dave Gahan joined the group and the band changed their name to Depeche Mode. Gore recalled, The name Depeche Mode came from Dave much later. He was doing fashion design and window display and used the magazine Depeche Mode as a reference. It means hurried fashion or fashion dispatch. I like the sound of that. Depeche Mode took the attitude of punk music and brought it together with the ultra-modern sounds of electronic instruments. Their signature was a blend of dark, industrial sounds woven into a danceable pop container. The band was approached by Mute Records founder Daniel Miller after he saw them performing at the Bridge House in Canning Town. Miller brought them into the studio where they recorded their debut single, Dreaming of Me, released in February of 1981. A second single, New Life, hit number 11 on the UK charts, followed by Just Can't Get Enough, which gave the band their first UK top 10 hit. It also established them as leaders of the increasingly emerging synth pop scene in the UK. Depeche Mode's debut album, Speak and Spell, was released on October the 5th, 1981. Clark quit the band after its release, which left the group without the primary songwriter. Martin Gore quickly stepped into this void, writing all of the songs that appeared on their second album, A Broken Frame, released in 1982. Gore's songwriting brought a darker, more existential turn to the band's sound. After Clark's departure, Depeche Mode brought in Alan Wilder, who would earn his reputation as the musical director of the band. Producer Flood explained to Pulse magazine in 1993, Alan is a sort of craftsman, Martin's the idea man, and Dave is the attitude. Depeche Mode's popularity began in the UK and moved first to Australia. In 1984, their single People Are People charted in the UK, Ireland, Switzerland, West Germany, and Canada, and hit number 14 in the Billboard Hot 100. Depeche Mode's US response largely began on the college radio and alternative rock circuit, in sharp contrast to the teen idol roles they held in Europe. But as the decade progressed, Depeche Mode brought their gothic, industrial sound to mainstream attention. The 1988 world tour ended with a concert at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California, with an audience of over 60,000 fans, was the venue's highest attendance in over eight years. That same year, they would perform Strange Love at the MTV Video Music Awards, a clear indication of the massive popularity they were experiencing at the time. At the height of this fame, the band returned to the studio to record their seventh studio album, Violator, which would catapult the band into international stardom, including two top 10 UK and US singles, Personal Jesus and Enjoy the Silence. Enjoy the Silence, as its title would suggest, began as a serene ballad written by Gore. Its lyrics search for a sense of peace in the chaos and pain of the world around. Gore has called it a song about being completely satisfied and not wanting or needing anything else. The chorus sings, All I ever wanted, all I ever needed is here in my arms. Words are very unnecessary. They can only do harm. Words are very unnecessary. And yet the song itself holds an infectious dance beat. Gave Gahan explained to Entertainment Weekly in 2017, funny enough, when Martin first came up with the demo for Silence, it was kind of half a song, just a piano and these very slow ballady couple of verses. And Alan and Flood, who was producing the album, had this idea to put a beat to it. Gore was skeptical at first, but soon realized the new direction was mesmerizing in its juxtaposition of meanings. I thought the very nature of the song was, you know, enjoy the silence, so it ought to have a very serene atmosphere. It took me a while to get used to the idea, but as we took it further, that way with the guitar riff, it really pulled it together. He also remarked, when I first finished the demo of the song, it was more of a ballad and sounded a bit like the harmonium version that came out on one of the formats. Alan had decided to speed it up and make it a bit more disco which I was really adverse to at first, because I thought the song is called Enjoy the Silence, and it's supposed to be about serenity, and serenity doesn't go with the disco beat. 
So I was sulking for about two days, but after he sped it up, I got used to it and added the guitar part, which adds to the whole atmosphere. We could really hear that it had a crossover potential. I have to say that I was sulking for two days for no reason. Dave Gahan takes his usual role as lead vocalist on the song, and Martin Gore provides the background vocals. Here's Dave Gahan's incredible vocal. Words like violence break the silence Come crashing in into my little world Painful to me, pierce right through me Can't you understand, oh my little girl All I ever wanted, all I ever needed Is here in my arms Words are very unnecessary They can only do harm Absolutely fantastic. All the effects printed on it is really kind of interesting to hear it like that. But Martin Gore is like pitch perfect. I mean, this is well before any kind of tuning. The expressiveness in Dave Gahan's vocal, that little vibrato he's got, and Martin Gore's pitch perfect harmony is just superb. The bass is a Moog, Mini Moog, Model D, and there's an ARP2600. Let's check it out. like violence break the silence come crashing in into my little world I mean, it's absolutely superb when i think about this track and you if you listen you put the kick and the snare into this first of all the kick is just immense and then the snare is just really just kind of almost white noise throw in the bass And then you've got the super organic elements of an incredible vocal, great background vocal, and of course, a hooky guitar part. It really does make you think about how much further along it seems we were in the 80s and the early 90s than we are now, that artists were able to take organic elements and blend them with electronic sounds and make it work so well. I feel like at the moment, everything's so either completely and utterly edited within an inch of its life and super auto-tuned or really, really super organic. And there's nothing in the middle that seems to make any sense like this does. The Emu Systems Emulator 2 was a sampler that would allow the user to get audio files saved on a floppy disk, which is exactly what Depeche Mode does for the choir and string sounds on this track. Several of the really interesting synth sounds don't enter until the very end of the track, including the chorus sound. The synth three is what gives the song its haunting opening, almost like a music box. It disappears for much of the track, but comes back in the middle. Such a cool sound. And you've got the synth chorus here. Which is great. It's kind of a blend of a string with a choral effect. The way the synths are working is it doesn't, it just feels like organically recorded synths. I mean, they sound performed. I'm sure 
I'm not sure, but I imagine there was some sequencing going on. But when you hear each hit, it's not like an identical eh, 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 eh. They all have their own variation in volume, variation in performance, and they all trigger the effects slightly differently. It really is a great lesson in being able to use synth sounds in a far more unique way than just the copy and paste MIDI world that we currently live in. It's really great food for thought about how we might blend organic and digital instruments together. It seems like <laughs> 35 years ago, they figured it out. So one of my favorite things about this song, of course, is the guitar part because it is sitting against that fully electronic sound. You know, with the whole track, you've got the It's a very, very cool haunting guitar part. Have a listen to it in solo. It's pretty special. Now, obviously, all of those incredible delays on it, it almost sounds like a DI'd guitar. There's also sort of a feeling of like, could it be um, a guitar, you know, going through a channel on the console? I know that with Niall Rogers, for instance, he would blend like an amp with a DI through the console. It has a little bit of that feel. It almost feels like it could be a DI off of an acoustic guitar, you know, blended in that way. It's got a really unique, very ultra clean sound and that sounds a little otherworldly. Have a listen to it again. Now in videos of the time, Martin is seen playing his Gretsch 6118 double anniversary. So it's possible it could be that, which sort of makes sense because it has a sort of an acoustic -y sound. You know, when I describe it sounding a little bit like a DI'd electric meets kind of an acoustic DI, maybe that is the answer, it's the Gretsch. I couldn't find much information about it, but I will say with its heavy processing, um, you know, you could probably get away with the, with most guitars, but it is an amazing guitar part. And it gives humanity to this song where you've got the, the drums, the bass, like super, super unorganic. sounds completely otherworldly. Absolutely superb. Enjoy the Silence and the rest of the Violator album was recorded between May of 1989 and January of 1990. They recorded at several different studio locations. Logic Studios in Milan, PUK Studios in Denmark, The Church and Master Rocker Studios in London, and Axis Studios in New York City. Enjoy the Silence in particular was recorded at PUK Studios and mixed at Master Rock Studios. The band's approach to the album was also a major departure from their previous methods of creating an album. Martin told NME in 1990, over the last five years, I think we'd perfected a formula. My demos, a month in a programming studio, etc., etc. We decided that our first record of the 90s ought to be different. I mean, Martin, Martin is the songwriter of the band, you know, and he comes up with his songs and, um, you know, there's different sort of roles within the band. As I said before, I think that when we actually made this album, there was a lot more, everyone was pulling their weight a lot more. And there was, you know, I certainly felt a lot more involved in this album than the album before. Just the way I was singing and everything as well, you know, I wanted to get it right, you know. Um, and Alan's involvement's a lot heavier and stuff as well, you know, even down to, right down to arrangements and things like that, you know. Um, 
and Fletcher's Fletcher's involvement's heavy as well. But he, he he goes off in other areas. He's very much more. He gets involved in all sorts of things that bore the rest of us, basically, the more sort of management side of things. Part of this new process was bringing in producer Mark Ellis, professionally known as Flood, to co-produce the album with the band. We, we were searching for someone else to work with us on the album, i.e. Flood, who we worked with on this album. We wanted someone basically could like make, give us a kick now and again and, and be able to pull us together and, and make the best of the songs. Um, with, without necessarily just our per pers perspective on it. You know, I think that was really important to this album, you know, and definitely at the end as well, someone like Francois Walker walking and coming in and mixing the album, you know, I mean, it wasn't an easy album to make, but it was enjoyable, I think, personally, you know. It, in what, it, in what way wasn't it easy? It took a long time. It's the longest we've ever spent on an album, um, over virtually a whole year. Um, well, because, you know, the, the idea was to, uh, you know, do the demos really basic and open, so that they could then take any direction when we got to the studio, so things could be more spontaneous in the studio. But, you know, half the time things work and half the time they don't. So when they don't work, then we'd have to go back and redo tracks or, you know, totally look at the approach again. The recording process for Enjoy the Silence was quick. Once it was determined that the song should have a more upbeat dance feel, things quickly fell into place. Gahan recalls, they said, get out of the studio and come back in two days. When we came back, Flood said to Martin, I need you to come up with a guitar line. So Martin started to play this riff, and that was it. When he said, Dave, go sing, and I did, we literally recorded it in a couple of days. And we started messing with the song, trying to make it more than it was, and it never needed more. We put it out like that, and I think we knew between us that there was something very special about it. But we had no idea what a huge hit it was going to be. Violator was mixed by Francois Kevorkian, and he did an initial mix of Enjoy the Silence along with the band. However, Mute founder Daniel Miller had a vision for the track and wanted to try mixing it himself with Philip Legg. Miller told Electronic Beats in 2013, the only thing about Francois Kevorkian's mixing was that while the record was great, I wasn't happy with Enjoy the Silence as it was. I had real demo-itis about it. I'd heard this rough version which they'd done, and in my head, that's how it had to sound. So I said, look, I love the album, but I'm not feeling the way Enjoy the Silence is at the moment. Can I go off and mix it with somebody else just to try it? So I went off with a guy called Phil Legg, who was an engineer I'd worked with, and I did it the way I'd always heard it. I think they were so burned out by the end, it took a long time making that record, that they said, OK, whatever you say, and they used that version. Enjoy the Silence was released on February the 5th, 1990, as the album's second single. The album itself followed on March the 19th. The song was an international hit, reaching the top 10 throughout Europe and the US. It took the number one spot on the US alternative airplay and the number two spot on the dance charts. It also held the number one single spot in Denmark, Poland and Spain. Violator hit number two on the UK albums chart. Enjoy the Silence won the Best British Single Award in 1991 and the song can be credited as one of the defining tracks of Depeche Mode's career, one that brought the band's groundbreaking electronic, industrial and synth-pop sounds into truly mainstream attention. Depeche Mode's music dominated the end of the 20th century, and their legacy has earned them entrance into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, where they were inducted in 2020. Everything about this band makes sense to me. It's a band that has a guitar. There's a great guitar parts in it. It is synth driven, electronic driven, but the songs are phenomenal. But it's more than that for me. Depeche Mode and the way they grew up is the way I grew up. When I was three or four years old, I went to um, Wednesday Club and Wednesday Club was the local church would, a place where kids would go after school, and I suppose parents could have some time off. And there I met one of my lifelong friends, Patrick Hannon, who is, if you don't already know, the drummer in a band called The Sundays. 
And I grew up in that environment. I grew up in exactly the same thing where we had close associations. Our first shows, our first rehearsal was in a little church hall. And we played shows at the fate, the local fate. It, it, this mirrors very much how I was brought up. And I just remember all the kids around that I knew in music, we had to have to be able to conjugate together and have halls and little rooms to practice in and play music together. And so when I read and I hear about the backstory of Depeche Mode, which I don't think I knew before we did some research because I was just a fan of the music and I knew about how it was recorded a lot more than I knew about their roots. But the roots are very typical of, you know, Gen Xers growing up in the UK at the time. They're a few years older than me. They're sort of the generation before me. But that upbringing of like the late 70s through the 80s and coming of age in the 90s, this was a band that really had it all, especially because they were successful in the UK and in Europe and Australia. and But America, they just blew up in the very late 80s and early 90s. And I remember coming to Los Angeles in a band in the mid 90s and getting a record deal here and having a studio in my apartment and recording bands. And I recorded tons of Latino bands because they all were huge fans of Depeche Mode and The Cure and New Order and Joy Division and The Bauhaus and all these bands that were just in my DNA growing up in the UK. And as I said when we were listening to the multitracks, one of the things that I keep feeling and thinking is like, how can we get back to when electronic elements and organic elements work together? I feel like even the bands that came a little bit after this, like um, Portishead and Massive Attack, they could do that. They can make it feel like it all made sense. At the moment, everything seems to be super gridded and auto-tuned or super organic, like I said earlier. What happened to when it came together and created this? When it created Enjoy the Silence, music like this. Food for thought. Thank you ever so much. Please give us, is there other songs like this that you feel like could do this, that could, could, could blend these elements together? Give us some suggestions below. Hope you enjoy this. Please check out the other videos in this series. So long, farewell, au revoir, au revoir, adios, adio, um, hedo, um, dos vidania, um, goodbye, farewell, so long, 